this series uh, on Philippians is wonderful. Last Sunday, Tim's message, if you weren't here as he opened up the first few verses of uh, uh, that wonderful letter, four chapters that are some of my favourite statements of scripture written by, by the Apostle Paul. Joy in the Shadows is our series and uh, today I'm, I'm sharing on discovering life in dying. Sounds paradoxical but it's true. Uh, in chapter one, uh, the very first chapter of Philippians, Paul shares his testimony and um, in the first few verses he alludes to his past and what's happened, and he's in jail. He's actually under house arrest in Rome, and he's there for two years. He's had actually three or four imprisonments. He got imprisoned in Caesarea and the Palestinian coast for a couple of years. He was in jail in Philippi, um, and now he's in jail, uh, house arrest, awaiting trial um, before Caesar, before Caesar's courts. And he's had a hard time, a tough time. If you want to get depressed, read from chapters 20 through to 28, the final journey of Paul. I mean people are literally wanting to tear him from limb to limb. In Jerusalem, it's so bad, the, the violence, that a, a maddened crowd want to destroy him, that the Roman soldiers, the centurion, had to actually had to carry him the soldiers lift him up so people couldn't get him as they brought him and said, what is going on? He so loved Jesus. He so was committed to sharing the message of salvation uh, with his own people, the Jewish people, that the religious leaders kind of attacked him because uh, of uh, the message of the gospel is that there is no other way. There's, there's only one way by which we can be saved. And that is through belief in Jesus and receiving him as one saviour. Uh, he lived and died on a cross and rose again and he lives forever. And it challenged the religious leaders and their views in Jerusalem. And so they stirred the crowds up to destroy him. So he's gone through a really difficult time. And he alludes to this in, in chapter 1. But he shares with them that in his present situation that he's in, he actually doesn't have a pity party. I don't know about you, but you know, when you go through a hard time, you know, kind of a, a demon of self-pity comes and sits on your shoulder and woe is me and how everything's so bad and, and you look at things negatively. You don't find that with Paul. Um, he is so thankful to God and he actually sees God's sovereignty at work even in his imprisonment. So he's under house arrest and, and because he was a Roman citizen... He made an appeal to Caesar. And so the emperors had their own legal system and, and citizens could appeal to them, whereas there were other courts for non-Romans and for other offences. And so, um, uh, so they put him under house arrest. So he's got a big house that he can be in. And they, but the guards were from Caesar's household. And so we don't think he was chained though he says, I'm, I'm chained, in the sense I'm in, I'm in prison, he's in house arrest. We have house arrest in Australia, where people are, uh, have to stay in their home, they're tagged, and et cetera. So, but there's a, a Roman guard, and the guards are from the Praetorian Guard. This is the palace guard. 9,000 elite soldiers that were Caesar's personal bodyguard. So the Romans had lots of armies, and as the... The, the government was being centralised under an emperor and ultimately it became where the emperor was worshipped as a god to unify the empire. There were lots of enemies and so the, the, the bodyguard of Caesar, the Praetorian Guard, were a bit like commandos, SAS, the elite troops, you know, secret service. And so they were paid twice as much, they were bigger, stronger, they were really... And their loyalty was to Caesar who would pay them out of his own purse. And so the Praetorian Guards were there for that two-year period, 9,000 of them in Rome, and then they would go throughout the empire. So who knows how many of them were on shifts? So a six-hour shift, another six-hour shift, another six-hour shift. And, and what's happening is they're observing Paul ministering. So people come to see Paul, what does he do? He shares about Jesus. 
People who, are, who come who are sick, he prays for them in Jesus' name that they get healed. If somebody is demonized, he's casting out the demon. If people need to speak in tongues, he starts to, because he says, I, I thank God I spoke in tongues more than you all. And so these soldiers, I reckon they're there all goggle-eyed, watching all this, hearing all this. How could you not be impacted? Many of them got saved. And Paul saw this was the hand of God. In spite of his sufferings, he sees God's sovereign, moving, in touching the lives of these guards. Have a look at verse 12 and 13. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. <laughs> and then at the very end of the chapter, he throws this little line in which... which uh, it's kind of coded language because he had to protect the Praetorian Guard too. And he goes, all God's people here send your greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. So heaps of them got saved. Now the beautiful thing about the Praetorian Guard is that the emperor would send them to the far reaches of the empire. So there were police stations all over the empire. And so there were governors and there were other politicians and minor kings. And as they endeavoured to administer the empire, there were lots of threats, lots of people that were trying to plan coup d'etats and get rid of the emperor. And so the Praetorian Guard were Caesar's eyes and ears. And they could see if there's anything seditious taking place. What do these guys, let's say out of 9,000, let's say maybe, let's say a couple of hundred of them got saved. Two in Britain, two or three in Gaul, a few in Spain, and they're all over the place. What are they doing when they're there? No doubt they will be sharing about Jesus. No doubt they would have led their families to Christ. And so here, Paul is imprisoned, but he sees God's sovereignty at work, good coming out of a pretty ugly and nasty situation. And then in verses 20 to 26, he probes the future. And this is a very powerful statement because Paul is now facing the reality that it may not end well. He may be beheaded at the end of the short trial. That's what would happen to a Roman citizen. So he's actually realising he may only have a few weeks or a few months to live. What would you do if you only had, if you were told you only had a few weeks and a few months to live. Paul is facing the reality that this could be it. He doesn't know where it's going to go. I'm reminded of Elijah. You read the story of how God says to him, Elijah, it's time for you to go. You're going to go to heaven. But Elijah somehow didn't see death. He was allowed to, to get caught up straight away and go to heaven. But basically God says to him, Elijah, you've only got a short time. Then you're gone. You're finished with this life here on earth. And when you read the story in uh, the second chapter of Kings, or the, the, the story of Elijah, or the final chapters of 1 Kings, the, the beginning chapters of, of 2 Kings, when I was reading it, and I spent probably three months into studying Elijah and Elisha and those two great guys, and, and, and I tried to put myself in the same position. I thought, what would I do if I was told in three or four days... You're going to go to heaven. Would I be going, whoa, catch up time. I better do a bit of Bible, extra Bible reading, more prayer. I better go and see this person and ask for forgiveness and get this per get, do this right, spend extra quality time with my kids. And, and would I do that? Did Elijah do that? What did Elijah do? Do you know what he did? He did what he kept on doing. Nothing changed in his conduct. He just conducted himself as he normally did. He'd go and visit the boys in the schools in Bethel and Gilgal and Jordan where he was training young men to, to operate as prophets. Nothing changed in how he outworked his daily conduct, yet he only knew he had a few days to live. And it really hit me. And I thought, that's... I want to follow Elijah. God says to me, you've only got... A short time left. I just want to be in the, in the, in the centre of his will 
and living for Jesus, living for him, loving my family, doing as much good to my fellow man, that nothing would actually change. It wouldn't be, oops, I better do some catch-up spiritual stuff. Oops, I better go and do a world trip. No. Paul, like Elijah, and maybe he was thinking of Elijah, he's actually facing the possibility that he may not pull through this. He may only have weeks to live, possibly a few months. So, premature death in the next few months. Paul has to confront what you and I have to face. All of us. One day, we will actually die. We won't be around on planet Earth. When you're young, you don't think about these things. I'm looking at all those and they're saying to me, I can read your mind. It's an awful long time when that's going to happen to me. Before you know it, guys, you're my age. And it seems so quick. But you know, he is thinking that one day, and it could be in a few weeks, a few months, I may not be here. We all have to face this reality that one day we will die. We're uncertain of the circumstances that are going to surround that event. We don't know. But we're absolutely certain that it's an experience that we all will face. It's inescapable. But nobody talks about it. I mean, when was the last... Do you know how to kill a good party? <laughs> kill it stone dead and people just want to go home? Is you having sit around with a group, experiment, do this with me, just experiment how to kill a party. And you're all having a great time, they're telling jokes and having a drink, not alcoholic drink, of course, and, and uh, eating and having fun. Then just say, guys, I'd like to us to have a discussion on how we would like to die. We're all gonna die. How would you like to die? Have you thought about when? How? In what circumstance? They're going to say, you are loco. You're crazy. Nobody does that. But the Apostle Paul, in, in the light of this stark reality, which, which came into Paul's mind because of his imprisonment, we discover what his attitude to life is. That's why we've called this message Discovering Life in Dying. And we learn what our attitude to life should be from his example. He's a fantastic example. And, and he, the six verses from verses 20 to 26, I couldn't get away from them. I thought I might jump into chapter 2 as well, but I'll leave that to Tim next week. But uh, have a read. Let me just read a couple of these verses. Magnificent answer. And he says, for Paul, life is all about exalting Christ. That's the first thing. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be what? Exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Let the future bring what it will, life or death. Christ will be exalted. Literally, the Greek says that Christ will be enlarged in my body, shown in all the dimensions of his greatness. His task, whatever the future turns out to be, Paul is saying, I'm not carrying a little snapshot of Jesus in my wallet for occasional sharing, but I am carrying a life-size Christ, a great big picture for all to look at. A Christ displayed in every dimension of my life and through every capability of my life. The Lord Jesus to Paul was the central controlling factor of his life. Whether in the thick of life, in the turmoil of difficult circumstances or in the heat of trial, the Christian, Paul is saying, is the one who sees no one but Jesus. How do we display Jesus? I've got photos in my wallet. I've got one of my four kids when they were babies. I just love that photo of the four of them. And uh, I still keep it there. 
And uh, just, I just was an image, it's an image that, that is uh, a beautiful image of when they were just babies, all under five years of age. And I've still kept it there. But um, we do carry photos around, don't we? But how do we display Jesus? Just little snapshots or are we carrying a life-size picture of Christ right before us and saying, here's the controlling influence and power of my life? How do we display him? By making Jesus the deciding factor in all of our choices. Do we make him the deciding factor in all of our choices? Or do we make our choices and say, now God bless them? Or are we saying, Lord, in my choices, guide me that I will do your will? Ensuring that the glory of Christ is our, is our number one concern. Is it the glory of Christ? We sang about the glory of Christ this morning. We sang about the goodness of Christ. By gearing the, our entire life in service to bring esteem to the one who alone is worthy, Jesus Christ. Never again, folks, will you have the chance to live for him through this moment. To please him in this circumstance that you're in. To gladden him by your trust and obedience on this day. Paul says life is about exalting Christ as he's reflecting on the possibility of his death. Whether I live or whether I die, I'm going to exalt him. Secondly, he says it's about gaining Christ. How's this? Read these powerful words. For me to live... To live is Christ and to die is what? Gain. <laughs> we read this and we go, I don't know what you're talking about. Let's just move on to the next verse. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. Now we know you. You're not with us, Paul. What the heck are you talking about? He is referring to the priceless value that he has in Jesus. Do you understand what he's saying? Look at chapter 3, verses 7 to 8. He says this about his own story. He says, but whatever were gains for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And that word garbage is pretty strong in the Greek. It's really a swear word today. It is, that's what it is, it's refuse. It's waste. He kind of gained a new perspective on life saying, you know what? Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing him, for whose sake I've lost all things. He's looking back to the day when Christ became everything to him. Paul had added up all that might have been counted as valuable to him, and he had found Christ more valuable, and he gladly surrendered all to him and, and for him. Verse 21, for me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. What? What? Paul is still counting and still finding the surpassing worth of Christ. Paul's whole life can be summed up as the progressive abandonment of everything else in the interest of possessing more and more of Christ. And Paul defines his life as gaining Christ, and get this, and death as the ultimate gain. In life, he is absorbed by dedicated living in Christ. In death... He expects to possess Christ totally. Death provides the entrance gate to the immediate presence of Christ. Life means Christ to me as I more fully know and love and serve him day by day. Death means Christ to me when I shall finally possess and eternally enjoy him. So to Paul, he has an impossible choice. Life or death. The benefits as Paul sees them are evenly balanced. Death 
the immediate gain of Christ. Life, the opportunity for greater fruitfulness for Christ. To die is glorious, for I possess Christ. To live is glorious, for I can bear fruit for Christ. That's why this statement is remarkable concerning the death for a Christian. He says, I desire to depart. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart. He's an old tent maker. So that was his, his tent making, you know, that, that we say tent making ministry. He literally made tents. And tents in those days were like being a builder. I mean, a lot of people lived in tents. <laughs> but, so it's a camping metaphor. So this old tent maker resorts to the language of his trade. So death for the Christian is the end of what is at best a transitory thing. A camp life in which one travels without a permanent resting place. I've been to lots of camps. I've done lots of camping trips. And uh, I tell you, some camps, you shake your head. And I've been to some places up in the Flinders Ranges when I was a university student at camps. And I mean, they, we'll put it this way, when you come back from those camps, you just realise how grateful you are for civilization. And you look at your toilet and you never take it for granted again. You're thankful for that loo. So I tell you, I've used some loos. Whew. I've been in some beds. Terrible. Showers that are rusting and then I'm in Papua New Guinea lathering up quickly because <laughs> every so often the, t- the water goes off. So you've got to be really quick. One minute shower. And every time that jolly water goes off and I'm fully lathered. What do you do? Well, you wake up in the middle of the night and there's cockroaches everywhere. And you think, oh, they've been on my dishes that I'm going to have breakfast with in the morning. So I come up with an old trick. When I arrive in these places, I grab all my cutlery, I, I, I heat them all up, put hot water, and I stick them in the fridge. Cockroach proof. As long as the fridge door can shut properly. It's not comfortable like home in some places. Camp life can be pretty rough. And Paul is saying, it's going to be exchanged one day for a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Look at 2 Corinthians 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Camp life is exchanged at death for home life with Christ. And also in this statement, he uses not just a camping metaphor, but a a boating metaphor. Like weighing the anchor, setting sail and releasing the vessel from its moorings in a foreign port so it can go to its home port. What Paul is saying, when a Christian dies, all the uncertainties and dangers now lie behind. The uncertainties and dangers, whether of camp life or of our temporary stay in a foreign port. Did you know that Paul was given a preview of heaven? He was given a preview of heaven. The only person in the New Testament that really gained a preview of what heaven is like. And he just goes, wow. And God says, I'm showing you. Keep your mouth shut. Don't tell too many people. Because they'll be too eager to get here before it's, before it's time. It blew him away. And he wasn't allowed to talk. He's the only person in the New Testament... And uh, several years ago, quite a few years ago, there were a group of preachers that said they visited heaven. They kind of did the circuit, traveling all over the world, their story. They wrote a book. I went to heaven, I saw my house and this and that. And I'm thinking, I heard a couple of them. I thought, no, nah, nah, I think they went in heaven in, the, in, in their minds. I don't think it actually happened. And I mean, who are they anyway? I mean, the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, he was given a glimpse and told, don't say anything. These guys have done nothing and they come back and tell everything. Ah, it didn't have authenticity to me. I'll stick with Paul. In 2 Corinthians 12, he says this. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Now, in the third heaven, what that means is beyond the first heaven is the atmosphere around the earth. The second heaven is the galaxies and the moon. And, and so, so that's, that's the language of that era. So he's actually saying that uh, I got caught up into the very presence of God, the immaterial, the invisible. 
Whether it was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. I don't know if it was real, he says, or whether it was a vision. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. Wow. C.S. Lewis, the writer of the Narnia series and so many other amazing Christian books, his picture of heaven is just so beautiful. Basically, he's saying in his writings that heaven is everything you have on earth, but so much more real. Everything you enjoy, the good things of life in, on this earth, but so much more real. So you think, okay, I enjoy nature. You smell a rose. And think, oh, man, that is beautiful. Man, you're smelling a rose produced from an earth that's been cursed by sin and pesticides and a body that ain't perfect. Like, you wait till you get to heaven. Then you can say, smell a rose. Say, that's a rose. Whew. Or you walk on the grass and it's so real, it almost cuts your feet. Oh, no blood. Or you drink water and it ain't Mount Franklin. I can feel the dirt particles in there. You'll drink water from heaven and you'll burn your throat. Oh, because it's so real. And I love that picture of what he's saying. He says, folks, Lewis is saying to us, earth is not some mystical place out there. It's real. It's more real than the physical world we live in because that's going to pass away. It's where God's abode is. And in Revelation 21 and Isaiah 11, it says there'll be no pain, no suffering, no sickness, no sin. No more tears, no more upsets. The devil will be destroyed. Sin has been dealt with. The lion and the lamb will live together. The child will play with a death adder and not be bitten. So with that picture, all of us are saying, man, come on, let's get there really quick. Isn't that right? We have a desire to say, let's just get there now. Yeah, yeah, is that you? You want to go right now? No. At the same time, as Paul presents this, he actually tells us that he has an equal desire to stay because it's not about him anymore. He wants to stay and be of benefit to his family, both natural family and spiritual family. At the same time. Here's another question. What place then does mourning and grief have for the Christian? If heaven is so good and it's so wonderful... Why do we mourn and, and grieve over the passing of a loved one? Well, the Apostle Paul, in the same letter, have a look at his feelings regarding his dear companion, Epaphrodites. Epaphrodites was sick, he was nearly going to die, and Paul says this to the Philippians. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. It's a very be beautiful statement. That in the same letter in which Paul sounds the note of confident expectation in the face of death, he also expresses the desolation which bereavement brings. Sorrow upon sorrow. Paul speaks of Epaphroditus' continuance in this life as a mercy from God. How right that is. We all live this life by the mercy of God. And... Um, you look at, we desire permanence here in this life and it's not at odds with our desire to be with Jesus Christ in heaven. Jesus and his best friend Lazarus. Remember when Lazarus died? Why didn't Jesus go, well, he's gone to a better place. Let's move on. What's all this crying about? Don't you guys know what, what heaven is like? He wasn't cold and callous and harsh and had it as a doctrine. I'm painting a picture that's a better place. But Jesus himself, who came from heaven, do you know what happened when his best friend Lazarus died? He wept like a baby. And he felt great sorrow. And he brought him back to life. 
because he wanted him here for himself for a period of time. Have a look at John 11. When Jesus saw her weeping, Mary and Martha, his sisters, and this, this, this family were dear friends of Jesus. He stayed with them every time he was in the Jerusalem area, in a place called Bethany, around the corner from Jerusalem. And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where, where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. He shed tears at the grave of Lazarus. He wanted him back, though he knew heaven was better. How many funerals have I taken? And... I don't even know the person, and I weep. I don't know the person. I had no relationship with them. I've taken funerals, but I'm watching the family, and as they share the stories, and I'm going, oh, everything within me. So, oh, the sorrow, you, you, the, the grief, the, the pain that people go through at loss. So we have a hope, a living hope that heaven is better Paul is also saying to us here, you know what? It should make us appreciate that we have, life is short and that we should do as much good to as many people as possible while we have life and breath. He says, for me to live is Christ. I want to exalt him in my body. I, I want to, to live a life where I'm gaining Christ. And finally, before I close in prayer, he says, life is about exalting Christ and gaining Christ, and it's about serving Christ. This is Paul's motive for living. In verse 24, 25, but it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Because you Philippians, it's better that I hang around. And you Romans, convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the Lord. So Paul loved Jesus with an abounding love and yearned for his company. As far as his personal enrichment is concerned, death wins hands down for Paul. However, such is his love for his spiritual family, for the Philippians, the Romans, and his desire to bless them and to serve them, that he desires to remain. The fruitfulness of remaining in this life could sway him against the joy of living with Christ. I thought once my kids were growing up, and they're in their 20s and, you know, the kind of, that, that's okay, if I, if I went to be with the Lord, they're okay. And then my grandkids started coming along. And something happened, resurrection occurred. Life, I'm thinking, no, I don't want to be with Jesus now. I want to be here because I want to help shape those little lives. I want to invest my best. I want to do a better job as a granddad than I did as a dad. And my kids said, Amen. That's the paradox of what Paul is saying. But church family, this passage he is saying, it does you the world of good to think about your death and to reflect on your, your, your impending death. It will come. And to reflect on where you're going, heaven and where that place is. And to have a picture that is better than life here. Yet the normal Christian life is, at the same time as that's rooted in our hearts and minds, we have a great desire to stay and to make our lives count. And look at the Apostle Paul. He says, God's sovereign. Even when I'm in prison, somehow God, Paul says, I couldn't plan this. Right under Caesar's nose. His bodyguard's getting saved and they're out there now sharing the gospel. They're my friends. They're my brothers in Christ. God is sovereign. Whatever you're going through, you may have had a shocking year so far. Your circumstances are just terrible. But I can affirm to you, God is sovereign. May he open your eyes to see how real he is, how alive he is, and what he's actually doing in you and through you. Don't be deceived by the devil that it's all dark. God is sovereign. He is alive. Yes, there's a wake-up call that we all need to, 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 to take and to receive and to look death in the face and not hide and not pretend. This is something we are all going to experience. Let God speak to you through this great apostle Paul and his statement. 
so that you will say, you know what, I'm going to exalt Christ whether I live or die. I'm going to gain Christ whether I live or die. And I'm going to serve Christ here and now. I'm going to serve him while, while I'm living here in this life. If you haven't given your life to Christ, he loves you so much that he came and died on a cross for you so that you could have the gift of heaven. And that comes through being forgiven of your sins. His blood was shed on the cross to cover all your sins. And he rose again and he sent the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit and the gift of forgiveness are linked together to help you live the Christian life and to be able to serve him and to face these truths with soberness and openness and honesty and to love life to the full and to want to serve him and yet to know it's all going to pass away. You're actually living in a tent. But you've got a permanent home established in heaven for you. Can you say amen to that?